Chapter 50 Blackthorn was sitting alone in the morning sun in a corner of the garden outside his guest house daydreaming, his dictionary in his hand. It was a fine cloudless day the first for many weeks and the fifth day since he had last seen Torunaga. All that time he had been confined to the castle, unable to see Mariko or visit his ship or crew, or explore the city, or go hunting or riding. Once a day he went swimming in one of the moats with other samurai, and to pass the time he taught some to swim and some to dive. But this did not make the waiting easier. So sorry, Anjin-san, but it's the same for everyone, Mariko had said yesterday when he met her by chance in his section of the castle. Even Lord Hiromatsu's been kept waiting. It's two days since he arrived, and he still hasn't seen Lord Toranaga. No one has. But this is important, Mariko-chan. I thought he understood every day's vital. Isn't there some way I can get a message to him? Oh yes, Anjin-san. That's simple. You just write. If you tell me what you want to say I'll write it for you. Everyone has to write for an interview, those are his present orders. Please be patient, that's all we can do. Then please ask for an interview. I'd appreciate it. That's no trouble, it's my pleasure. Where have you been? It's four days since I saw you. Please excuse me but I've had to do so many things. It sits a little difficult for me, so many preparations. What's going on? This whole castle's been like a hive about to swarm for almost a week now. Oh, so sorry. Everything's fine, Anjin-san. Is it? So sorry, a general and a senior administrator commit seppuku in the dungeon forecourt. That's usual? Lord Torinaga locks himself away in the ivory tower, keeping people waiting without apparent reason that's also usual. What about Lord Hiromatsu? Lord Torinaga is our lord. Whatever he does is right. And you, Mariko-san? Why haven't I seen you? Please excuse me, so sorry, but Lord Torinaga ordered me to leave you to your studies. I'm visiting your consort now, Anjin-san. I'm not supposed to visit you. Why should he object to that? Merely, I suppose, so that you are obliged to speak our tongue. It's only been a few days, nay? When are you leaving for Osaka? I don't know. I expected to go three days ago, but Lord Torinaga hasn't signed my pass yet. I've arranged everything porters and horses and daily I submit my travel papers to his secretary for signing, but they're always sent back. Submit them tomorrow. I thought I was going to take you to Osaka by sea. Didn't he say I was to take you by sea? Yes. Yes, he did. But well, Anjin-san, you never know with our liege lord. He changes plans. Has he always been like that? Yes and no. Since Yoko's he's been filled with how do you say it melancholy? Nay, yes, melancholy, and very different. He yes, he's different now. Since first bridge you've been filled with melancholy and very different. Yes, you're different now. First bridge was an end and a beginning, Anjin-san, and our promise. Nay? Yes. Please excuse me. She had bowed sadly and left, and then, once safely away, not turning back, she had whispered, Thou. The word lingered in the corridor with her perfume. At the evening meal he had tried to question Fujiko. But she also knew nothing of importance or would not, or could not, explain what was amiss at the castle. Dozo gomen nasai, Anjin-san. He went to bed seething. Seething with frustration over the delays, and the nights without Mariko. It was always bad knowing she was so near, that Buntaro was gone from the city, and now, because of the thou that her desire was still as intense as his. A few days ago he had gone to her house on the pretext that he needed help with Japanese. The samurai guard had told him, so sorry, she was not at home. He had thanked them, then wandered listlessly to the main south gate. He could see the ocean. Because the land was so flat, he could see nothing of the wharves or docks though he thought he could distinguish the tall masts of his ship in the distance. The ocean beckoned him. It was the horizon more than the deep, 
the need for a fair wind washing him, eyes squinting against its strength, tongue tasting its salt, the deck heeled over, and aloft the spars and rigging and halyards creaking and groaning under the press of sails that, from time to time, would cackle with glee as the stalwart breeze shifted a point or two. And it was freedom more than the horizon. Freedom to go to any quarter in any weather at any whim. To stand on his quarter-deck and to be arbiter, as here Toranaga alone was arbiter. Blackthorn looked up at the topmost part of the dungeon. Sun glinted off its shapely tiled curves. He had never seen movement there, though he knew that every window below the topmost floor was guarded. Gong sounded the hour change. For the first time his mind told him this was the middle of the hour of the horse, and not eight bells of this watch high noon. He put his dictionary into his sleeve, glad that it was time for the first real meal. Today it was rice and quick broiled prawns and fish soup and pickled vegetables. Would you like some more, Anjin san? Thank you, Fujiko. Yes. Rice, please. And some fish. Good very. He looked up the word for delicious and said it several times to memorize it. Yes, delicious, nay? Fujiko was pleased. Thank you. This fish from north. Water colder north, understand? Its name is Kurimabi. He repeated the name and put it into his memory. When he had finished and their trays were taken away, she poured more cha and took a package out of her sleeve. Here money, Anjin-san. She showed him the gold coins. Fifty koban. Worth one hundred fifty koku. You want it, nay? For sailors. Please excuse me, do you understand? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Enough? Yes. Think so. Where get? Toranaga-sama's chief. Fujiko sought a simple way to say it. I go important Toranaga man. Headman. Like Mura, nay? Not samurai only moneyman. Sign my name for you. Ah, uh, understand. Thank you. My money? My koku? Oh, yes. This house. Food. Servants. Who pay? Oh, I pay. From your from koku one year. Is that enough, please? Enough koku? Oh, yes. Yes, I believe so. She said. Why worry? Worry in face? Oh, please excuse me, Anjin-san. I'm not worried. No worry. Pain? Burn pain? No pain. See. Fujiko carefully got off the thick cushions he insisted she use. She knelt directly onto the tatamas with no sign of discomfort, then sat back on her heels and settled herself. There, all better. Ye, very good, he said, pleased for her. Show, eh? She got up carefully and lifted the hem of her skirts and allowed him to look at the backs of her legs. The scar tissue had not split and there were no suppurations. Very good, he said. Yes, soon like baby skin, nay? Eh? Thank you, yes. Soft. Thank you, Anjin-san. He noticed a slight change in her voice but did not comment. That night he did not dismiss her. The pillowing was satisfactory. No more. For him there was no afterglow, no joyous lassitude. It was just a mating. So wrong, he thought, yet not wrong, nay? Eh? Before she left him she knelt and bowed again to him and put her hands on his forehead. I thank you with all my heart. Please sleep now, Anjin-san. Thank you, Fujiko-san. I sleep later. Please sleep now. It is my duty and would give me great pleasure. The touch of her hand was warm and dry and not pleasing. Nonetheless he pretended to sleep. She caressed him ineptly though with great patience. Then, quietly, she went back to her own room. Now alone again, glad to be alone. Blackthorn propped his head on his arms and looked up into the darkness. He had decided about Fujiko during the journey from Yoko's to Yido. It is your duty, Mariko had told him, lying in his arms. I think that'd be a mistake, nay? 
If she gets with child, well, it'll take me four years to sail home and come back again, and, in that time, God knows what could happen. He remembered how Mariko had trembled then. Oh, Anjin-san, that is very much time. Three then. But you'll be aboard with me. I'll take you back with thy promise, my darling. Nothing that is, nay? Thou art right. Yes. But with Fujiko, so many bad things could happen. I don't think she would want my child. You do not know that. I do not understand you, Anjin-san. It is your duty. She could always prevent a child, nay? Don't forget, she is your consort. In truth, you take away her face if you don't invite her to the pillow. After all, Torunaga himself ordered her into your house. Why did he do that? I don't know. It doesn't matter. He ordered it, therefore it is the best for you and best for her. It has been good, nay? She's done her duty as best she can, nay? Please excuse me, but don't you think he should do yours? Enough of your lectures. Love me and do not talk any more. How should I love thee? Ah, uh, like Kiku-san told me today? How is that? Like this. That is very good, so very good. Oh, I forgot. Please light the lamp, Anjin-san. I have something to show thee. Later, now I... Oh, please excuse me. It should be now. I bought it for you. It's a pillow book. The pictures are very funny. I don't want to look at a pillow book now. But, so sorry, Anjin-san, perhaps one of the pictures would excite you. How can you learn about pillowing without a pillow book? I'm excited already. But Kiku-san said it's a very first best way of choosing positions. There are 47. Some of them look astonishing and very difficult, but she said it was important to try all. Why do you laugh? You're laughing why shouldn't I laugh too? But I was laughing because you were chuckling and I felt your stomach shaking and you won't let me up. Please let me up. Anjin-san. Ah, but you can't be cross, Mariko my darling. There's no woman in the world who can be really even a little cross like this. But Anjin-san, please, you must let me up. I want to show you. All right. If that, oh no, Anjin-san, I didn't want you must can't you just reach out please not yet oh. Please don't leave me, oh, how I love thee like this. Blackthorn remembered that loving. Mariko excited him more than Kiku had, and Fujiko was nothing compared to either. And Felicity? Ah, uh, Felicity, he thought, focusing on his great problem. I must be mad to love Mariko and Kiku. And yet. The truth about Felicity is that now she can't compare even with Fujiko. Fujiko was clean. Poor Felicity. I'll never be able to tell her, but the memory of her and me rutting like a pair of stoats in the hay or under rancid covers makes my skin crawl now. Now I know better. Now I could teach her but would she wish to learn? And how could we ever get clean and stay clean and live clean? Home is filth piled on filth, but that's where my wife is and where my children are and where I belong. Don't think about that home, Anjin-san. Mariko had once said when the dark mists were on him. Real home is here the others ten million times ten million sticks away. Here is reality. You'll send yourself mad if you try to get wa out of such impossibilities. Listen, if you want peace you must learn to drink cha from an empty cup. She had shown him how. You think reality into the cup, you think the cha there the warm, pale green drink of the gods. If you concentrate hard. Oh, a Zen teacher could show you, Anjin-san. It is most difficult but so easy. How I wish I was clever enough to show it to you for. Then all things in the world can be yours for the asking. Even the most unobtainable gift perfect tranquility. He had tried many times, but he could never sip the drink when it wasn't there. Never mind, Anjin-san. It takes such a long time to learn, but you will, sometime. Can you? Rarely. Only in moments of great sadness or loneliness. But the taste of the unreal cha seems to give a meaning to life. It is hard to explain. I've done it once or twice. Sometimes you gain what just by trying. 
Now, lying in the dark of the castle, sleep so far away, he lit the candle with the flint and concentrated on the little porcelain cup that Mariko had given him which now he always kept beside his bed. For an hour he tried, but he could not purify his mind. Inevitably the same thoughts kept chasing each other. I want to leave, I want to stay. I'm afraid of going back, I'm afraid to remain. I hate both and want both. And then there are the eaters. If it was up to me alone I wouldn't leave, not yet. But others are involved and they're not eaters and I signed on as pilot. By the Lord God I promised to take the fleet out and through the grace of God bring her home again. I want Mariko. I want to see the land Toranaga's given me and I need to stay here, to enjoy the fruit of my great luck for just a little longer. Yes. But also duties involved and that transcends everything, nay? With the dawn Blackthorn knew that though he pretended he had put off the decision again, in reality, he had decided. Irrevocably. God help me, first and last I'm pilot. Toranaga uncurled the tiny slip of paper that arrived two hours after dawn. The message from his mother said simply, Your brother agrees, my son. His letter of confirmation will leave today by hand. The state visit of Lord Sadara and his family must begin within ten days. Toranaga sat down weakly. The pigeons fluttered in their roosts then settled back once more. Morning sun filtered into the loft pleasingly though rain clouds were building. Gathering his strength, he hurried down the steps into his quarters below to begin. Naga-san! Yes, father? Send Hiromatsu-san here. After him, my secretary. Yes, father. The old general came quickly. His joints were creaking from the climb and he bowed low, his sword loose in his hands as ever, his face fiercer than ever, older than ever, and even more resolute. You're welcome, old friend. Thank you, Lord. Hiromatsu looked up. I'm saddened to see the cares of the world are in your face. And I'm saddened to see and hear so much treason. Yes. Treason is a terrible thing. Toranaga saw the firm old eyes measuring him. You can speak freely. Have you ever known me not to, sire? The old man was grave. Please excuse me for keeping you waiting. Please excuse me for troubling you. What is your pleasure, sire? Please give me your decision about the future of your house. Is it finally Osaka bending to that manure pile? Have you ever known me to make a final decision about anything? Hiromatsu frowned, then thoughtfully straightened his back to ease the ache in his shoulders. I've always known you to be patient and decisive, and you've always won. That's why I can't understand you now. It's not like you to give up. Isn't the realm more important than my future? No. Ishido and the other regents are still legal rulers according to the Taiko S. Will. I am the vassal of Yoshi Toranaga no Minowara and I acknowledge no one else. Good. The day after tomorrow is my chosen day to leave for Osaka. Yes. I've heard that. You'll be in command of the escort, Bantaro second in command. The old general sighed. I know that too, sire. But since I've been back, sire, I've talked to your senior advisors and Jenner, yes. I know. And what is their opinion? That you should not leave Yido. That your orders should be temporarily overruled. By whom? By me. By my orders. That's what they wish? Or that is what you've decided? Hiromatsu put his sword on the floor nearer to Toranaga and now defenseless, Look directly at him. Please excuse me, sire. I wish to ask you what I should do. My duty seems to tell me I should take command and prevent your leaving. This will at once force Ishido to come against us. Yes, of course we will lose, but that seems to be the only honorable way. But stupid, nay? The general's iron-gray brows nodded. No. We die in battle, with honor. We regain wa. The Quanto is a spoil of war, but will not see the new master in this life. Shigata G.A. Nye. I've never enjoyed expending men uselessly. I've never lost a battle and see no reason why I should begin now. 
Losing one battle is no dishonor, sire. Is surrender honorable? You are all agreed in this treason? Sire, please excuse me. I asked individuals for a military opinion only. There's no treason or plot. You still listen to treason? Please excuse me, but if I agree as your commander-in-chief, then it no longer becomes treason but legal state policy. Taking decisions away from your liege lord is treason. Sire, there are too many precedents for deposing a lord. You've done it, Garota did it, the Tycho Weavy all done that and worse. A victor never commits treason. You've decided to depose me? I ask for your help in the decision. You're the one person I thought I could trust. By all gods I only wish to be your most devoted vassal. I'm only a soldier. I wish to do my duty to you. I think only of you. I merit your trust. If it will help take my head. If it will convince you to fight, I gladly give you my life, my clan's life blood, today in public or private or whatever way you wish I sent out what our friend General Kyoshio did. I'm sorry, but I do not understand why I should permit you to throw away a lifetime of effort. Then you refuse to obey my orders to head the escort that will leave for Osaka the day after tomorrow? A cloud passed over the sun and both men looked out of the windows. It'll rain again soon, Torinaga said. Yes. There's been too much rain this year, nay? The rains must stop soon or the harvest will be ruined. They looked at each other. Well, Iron Fist said simply, I formally ask you, sire, do you order me to escort you from Yido, the day after tomorrow, to begin the trek to Osaka? As there seems to be advice from all my counselors to the contrary, I'll accept their opinion, and yours, and delay my departure. Hiromatsu was totally unprepared for this. Eh? You won't be leaving? Torunaga laughed, the mask fell off, and he was the old Torunaga again. I never intended to go to Osaka. Why should I be so stupid? What? My agreement at Yokos was nothing more than a trick to gain time, Torinaga said affably. Ishido took the bait. The fool expects me in Osaka within a few weeks. Zataki also took that bait. And you and all my valiant, untrusting vassals also took the bait. With no real concession whatsoever I've gained a month, put Ishido and his filthy allies in turmoil. I hear they're already scrambling for the Quanto. Kiyama's been promised it as well as Zataki. You never intended to go? Hiromatsu shook his head, then as the clarity of the idea suddenly hit him, his face broke into a delighted grin. It's all a ruse? Of course. Listen, everyone had to be taken in, nay? Zataki, everyone, even you. Or spies would have told Ishido, and he would have moved against us at once, and no good fortune on earth or gods in heaven could have prevented disaster to me. That's true. Ah, Lord, forgive me. I'm so stupid. I deserve to lose my head. So it was all nonsense, always nonsense. But, but what about General Kyoshio? He said he was guilty of treason. I don't need treasonous generals only obedient vassals. But why attack Lord Sidara? Why withdraw your favor from him? Because it pleases me to do so, Torinaga said harshly. Yes. Please excuse me. That's your sole privilege. I beg you to forgive me for doubting you. Why should I forgive you for being you, old friend? I needed you to do what you did and say what you said. Now I need you more than ever. I must have someone I can trust. That's why I'm taking you into my confidence. This has got to be secret between us. Oh, sire. You make me so happy. Yes, Torinaga said. That's the only thing I'm afraid of. Sire? Your commander-in-chief. You alone can neutralize this stupid, brooding mutiny while I'm waiting. I trust you and must trust you. My son can hold my generals in check, though he'd never show our joy at the secret if he knew it but your face is the gateway to your soul, old friend. Then let me take my life after I've settled the generals. That's no help. 
You must hold them together pending my pretended departure, nay? You'll just have to guard your face and your sleep like never before. You're the only one in all the world who knows you're the only one I must trust, nay? Forgive me for my stupidity. I won't fail. Explain to me what I must do. Say to my generals what's true that you persuaded me to take your advice, which is also theirs, nay. I formally order my departure postponed for seven days. Later I'll postpone it again. Sickness this time. You're the only one to know. Then? Then it will be Crimson Sky? Not as originally planned. Crimson Sky was always the last plan, nay? Yes. What about the musket regiment? Could it blast a path through the mountains? Part of the way. But not all the way to Kyoto. Have Zataki assassinated? That might be possible. But Ishido and his allies are still invincible. Torunaga told him the arguments of Omi, Yabu, Igarashi, and Bantaro the day of the earthquake. At that time I ordered Crimson Sky as another feint to throw Ishido into confusion and also had the right parts of the discussion whispered into the wrong ears. But the fact is, Ishido's force is still invincible. How can we split them up? What about Kiyama and Onoshir? No, those two are implacably against me. All the Christians will be against me except my Christian, and I will soon put him and his ship to very good use. Time is what I need most. I've allies and secret friends throughout the empire, and if I have time, every day I gain weakens Ishido further. That's my battle plan. Every day of delay is important. Listen, after the rains, Ishido will come against the Quanto, a simultaneous pincer, Ikawa Jiku spearheading the south, Zataki in the north. We contain Jiku at Mishima, then fall back to the Hakoni Pass and Odawara, where we make our final stand. In the north we'll hold Zataki fast in the mountains along the Hasho Kaido road somewhere near Mikawa. It's true what Omi and Igarashi said. We can hold off the first attack and there shouldn't be another great invasion. We fight and we wait behind our mountains. We fight and delay and wait and then when the fruit is ripe for plucking crimson sky. Yee, let that day be soon. Listen, old friend, only you can hold my generals in check. With time and the Quanto secure, completely secure, we can weather the first attack and then Ishido's alliances will begin to break up. Once that happens, Yemen's future is assured and the Taiko S testament inviolate. You will not take soul power, sire? For the last time, the law may upset reason, but reason may never upset the law, or our whole society will shred like an old tatame. The law may be used to confound reason. Reason must certainly not be used to overthrow the law. The Taiko S will is law. Hiromatsu bowed in acceptance. Very well, sire. I will never mention it again. Please excuse me. Now. He let his smile show. Now, what must I do? Pretend that you've persuaded me to delay. Just keep them all in your iron fist. How long must I keep up the pretense? I don't know. I don't trust myself, sire. I may make a mistake, not meaning to. I think I can keep the joy off my face for a few days. With your permission my ache should become so bad that I'll be confined to bed no visitors, nay? Good. Do that in four days. Let some of the pain show from today on. That won't be difficult, nay? No, sire. So sorry. I'm glad the battle begins this year. Next. I may not be able to help. Nonsense. But it will be this year whether I say yes or no. In sixteen days I will leave Yido for Osaka. By that time you will have given your reluctant approval, and you will lead the march. Only you and I know there will be further delays and that long before I reach my borders I'll turn back to Yido. Please forgive me for doubting you. If it wasn't that I must remain alive to help your plans I could not live with my shame. No need for shame, old friend. If you hadn't been convinced, Ishido and Zataki would have seen through the trick. Oh, by the way, how was Bantaro-san when you saw him? Seething, sire. It will be good to have a battle for him to fight. 
He suggested removing me as liege lord? If he'd said that to me, I would have removed his head. At once. I'll send for you in three days. Ask to see me daily, but I'll refuse until then. Yes, sire. The old general bowed abjectly. Please forgive this old fool. You've given my life purpose again. Thank you. He left. Torinaga took out the little slip of paper from his sleeve and reread the message from his mother with enormous satisfaction. With the northern route possibly open and Ishido possibly betrayed there, his odds had enormously improved. He put the message to the flame. The paper curled into ash. Contentedly, he pounded the ash to dust. Now, who should be the new commander-in-chief? He asked himself. At noon, Mariko walked across the dungeon forecourt, through the silent ranks of brooding guards, and went inside. Torinaga's secretary was waiting for her in one of the anterooms on the ground floor. So sorry to send for you, Lady Toda, he said listlessly. It's my pleasure, Kawanabi-san. Kawanabi was a sharp-featured, elderly samurai with a shaven head. Once he had been a Buddhist priest. For years now he had handled all of Toranaga's correspondence. Normally he was bright and enthusiastic. Today, like most people in the castle, he was greatly unsettled. He handed her a small scroll. Here are your travel documents for Osaka, duly signed. You are to leave tomorrow and get there as soon as possible. Thank you. Her voice sounded tiny to her. Lord Toronaga says he may have some private dispatches for you to take to Lady Karitsubo and Lady Koto. Also for General Lord Ishido and Lady Okiba. They'll be delivered to you tomorrow at dawn if... So sorry if they're ready, I'll see they're delivered to you. Thank you. From a number of scrolls that were stacked with pedantic neatness on his low desk, Kawanabi selected an official document. I'm directed to give you this. It is the increase in your son's fief as promised by Lord Toranaga. Ten thousand koku yearly. It's dated from the last day of last month and... Well, here it is. She accepted it, read it, and checked the official chops. Everything was perfect. But it gave her no happiness. Both believed it was an empty paper now. If her son's life was spared, he would become Ronin. Thank you. Please thank Lord Toranaga for the honor he does us. May I be allowed to see him before I go? Oh, yes. When you leave here now you're asked to go to the barbarian ship. You're requested to wait for him there. I'm I'm to interpret? He didn't say. I would presume so, Lady Toda. The secretary squinted at a list in his hand. Captain Yashinaka's been ordered to lead your escort to Osaka, if it pleases you. I would be honored to be in his charge again. Thank you. May I ask how Lord Toranaga is? He seems well enough, but for an active man like him to coop himself up for days on end. What can I say? He spread his hands helplessly. So sorry. At least today he saw Lord Hiramatsu and agreed to a delay. He's also agreed to deal with a few other things. Rice prices must be stabilized now in case of a bad harvest. But there's so much to do and... It's just not like him, Lady Toda. These are terrible times, nay? And terrible omens. The soothsayers say the harvest will be ruined this year. I will not believe them until harvest time. Wise, very wise. But not many of us will see harvest time. I'm to go with him to Osaka. Kawanabi shivered and leaned forward nervously. I heard a rumor that the plague's begun again between Kyoto and Osaka smallpox. Is that another heavenly sign that the gods are turning their faces from us? It's not like you to believe rumors or heavenly signs, Kawanabi-san, or to pass on rumors. You know what Lord Toranaga thinks of that. I know. So sorry. But, well... No one seems to be normal these days, nay? Perhaps the rumor's not true, I pray it's not true. She shook off her foreboding. Has the new date for the departure been set? I understood Lord Hiramatsu to say that it was postponed for seven days. 
I'm so glad our commander-in-chief returned and so glad he persuaded. I wish the whole departure was put off forever. Better fight here than be dishonored there, nay? Yes. She agreed, knowing there was no point any longer in pretending that this was not foremost in everyone's mind. Now that Lord Hiromatsu's back, perhaps our lord will see that surrender's not the best course. Lady, for your ears alone. Lord Hiromatsu. He stopped, looked up, and put a smile on his face. Yabu strode into the room, swords jingling. Ah, Lord Kasiji Yabu, how nice to see you. He bowed and Mariko bowed and there were pleasantries and then he said, Lord Toronaga's expecting you, sire. Please go up at once. Good. What does he want to see me about? So sorry, sire, he didn't tell me only that he wished to see you. How is he? Kawanabi hesitated. No change, sire. His departure has a new date been fixed? I understand it'll be in seven days. Perhaps Lord Hiromatsu will put it off even more, nay? That would be up to our lord, sire. Of course. Yabu walked out. You were saying about Lord Hiromatsu? Only for your ears, Lady as Bantaro san's not here. The secretary whispered. When old Iron Fist came from seeing Lord Toranaga, he had to rest for the best part of an hour. He was in very great pain, lady. Oh, it would be terrible if something happened to him now. Yes. Without him there'd be a revolt, nay? This delay solves nothing, does it? It's only a truce. The real problem I'm, I'm afraid since Lord Sadara acted as formal second to General Kyoshio. Every time Lord Sadara's name has been mentioned our lord gets very angry. It's only Lord Hiromatsu who's persuaded him to delay, and that's the only thing that. Tears started running down the secretary's cheeks. What's happening, lady? He's lost control, nay? No, she said firmly, without conviction. I'm sure everything will be all right. Thank you for telling me. I'll try to see Lord Hiromatsu before I leave. Go with God, lady. She was startled. I didn't know you were Christian, Kawanabi-san. I'm not, lady. But I know it is your custom. She walked out into the sun, greatly concerned over Hiromatsu, at the same time blessing God that her waiting was over and tomorrow she would escape. She went toward the palanquin and escort waiting for her. Ah, Lady Toda, Gyoko said, stepping out of the shadows, intercepting her. Ah, good morning, Gyoko-san. How nice to see you. I hope you're well, she said pleasantly, a sudden chill rushing through her. Not well at all, I'm afraid, so sorry. So very sad. It seems we're not in our lord's favor, Kikusan and I. Ever since we got here we've been confined to a filthy third-class hotel I wouldn't put an eighth-class male courtesan in. Oh, so sorry. I'm sure there must be some mistake. Ah, uh, yes, a mistake. I certainly hope so, lady. At long last today I've been given permission to come to the castle. At long last there's an answer to my petition to see the great lord. At long last I'm permitted to bow before the great lord again later today. Gyoko smiled at her crookedly. I heard you were also coming to see the lord's secretary, so I thought I'd wait to greet you. I hope you don't mind. It's a pleasure to see you, Gyoko-san. I would have visited you and Kikusan, or asked you both to visit me, but unfortunately that hasn't been possible. Yes, so sad. These are sad times. Difficult for nobles. Difficult for peasants. Perk Kakusan's quite sick with worry to be out of our lord's favor. I'm sure she's not, Gyoko-san. He lord Toranaga has many pressing problems, nay? True, true. Perhaps we could take some cha now, Lady Toda. I would be honored to be allowed to talk to you for a moment. Ah, so sorry, but I'm ordered to go on official business. Otherwise I would have been honored. Ah, yes, you've to go to the Anjin Sands ship now. Ah, I forgot, so sorry. How is the Anjinsen? I believe he is well, Mariko said, furious that Gyoko knew her private business. I've seen him only once and then just for a few moments since we arrived. 
an interesting man. Yes, very. Sad not to see one's friends, nay? Both women wore smiles, their voices polite and carefree, both conscious of the impatient samurai watching and listening to them. I heard the Anjin San visited his friends, his crew. How did he find them? He never told me, Gyoko san. As I said, I only saw him for a moment. So sorry, but I must go. Sad not to see one's friends. Perhaps I could tell you about them. For instance, that they live in an ETA village. What? Yes. It seems his friends asked permission to live there, preferring it to civilized areas. Curious, nay? Not like the Anjin San, who's different. The rumor is they say it's more like home to them the ETA village. Curious, nay. Mariko was remembering how strange the Anjin San had been on the stairs that day. That explains it, she thought. Eita. Madonna, poor man. How ashamed he must have been. I'm sorry, Gyoko san, what did you say? Just that it's curious the Anjin san's so different from the others. What are they like? Have you seen them? The others? No, lady. I wouldn't go there. What should I have to do with them? Or with ETA? I must think of my clients and my Kiku-san. And my son. Ah, yes, your son. Gyoko's face saddened under her parasol, but her eyes remained flinty brown like her kimono. Please excuse me, but I suppose you've no idea why we should be out of favor with Lord Toranaga? No. I'm sure you're mistaken. The contract was settled, nay? According to the agreement? Oh, yes, thank you. I've a letter of credit on the Mishima Rice Merchants, payable on demand. Less the amount we agreed. But money was furthest from my mind. What's money when you've lost the favor of your patron whoever he or she is? Nay, I'm sure you retain his favor. Ah, favors. I was worried about your favor, too, Lady Toda. You always have my goodwill. And friendship, Gyoko-san. Perhaps we could talk another time. I really must go now, so sorry. Ah, yes, how kind you are. I'd enjoy that. Gyoko added in her most honeyed voice as Mariko began to turn away. But will you have time? You go tomorrow, nay? To Osaka? Mariko felt a sudden ice barb in her chest as the trap closed. Is there anything wrong, lady? No. No, Gyoko-san. Will. During the hour of the dog tonight. Would that be convenient? You're too kind, lady. Oh, yes, as you're going to see our master now, before me, would you intercede for us? We need such a little favor. Nay. I would be glad to. Mariko thought a moment. Some favors can be asked, but even so, are not granted. Gyoko stiffened slightly. Ah, uh, you've already asked him to. Asked him to favor us? Of course, why shouldn't I? Mariko said carefully. Isn't Kikusan a favorite? And aren't you a devoted vassal? Haven't you been granted favors in the past? My requests are always so little. Everything I said before still applies, lady. Perhaps more so. About empty-bellied dogs. About long ears and safe tongues. Ah, yes. And secrets. It would be so easy to satisfy me. My lord's favor and my lady's is not much to ask, nay? No. If an opportunity occurs. I can promise nothing. Until this evening, lady. They bowed to each other, and no samurai was any the wiser. Mariko got into the palanquin to more bows, hiding the trembles that beset her, and the cortege left. Gyoko stared after her. You, woman, a young samurai said roughly as he passed. What are you waiting for? Go about your business. Ha! Gyoko said disdainfully to the amusement of others. Woman, is it puppy? If I went about your business I might have a very hard time finding it, hey, even though you're not yet man enough to have thatch. The others laughed. With a toss of her head she walked on fearlessly. Hello, Blackthorn said. Good afternoon, Anjin-san. You look happy. Thank you. 
It's the sight of such a lovely lady, nay? Ah, thank you, Bariko replied. How is your ship? First class. Would you like to come aboard? I'd like to show you around. Is that permitted? I was ordered here to meet Lord Toranaga. Yes. We're all waiting for him now. Blackthorn turned and spoke to the senior samurai on the wharf. Captain, I take Lady Tota there. Show ship. When Lord Toranaga arrive you call, nay? As you wish, Anjin-san. Blackthorn led the way off the jetty. Samurai were manning the barriers and security was tighter than ever, ashore and on deck. First he went to the quarterdeck. This is mine, all mine, he said with pride. Are any of your crew here? No, none. Not today, Mariko-san. He pointed out everything as quickly as he could, then guided her below. This is the main cabin. The aft bay windows overlooked the foreshore. He closed the door. Now they were totally alone. This is your cabin? she asked. He shook his head, watching her. She went into his arms. He held her tight. Oh, how I have missed thee. And I have missed thee. There's so much to tell thee. And to ask thee, he said, I've nothing to tell thee, except that I love thee with all my heart. She shivered in his arms, trying to throw off her terror that Gyoko or someone would denounce them. I'm so afraid for thee. Don't be afraid, Mariko, my darling. Everything's going to be all right. That's what I tell myself. But today it's impossible to accept karma and the will of God. You were so distant the last time. This is Yido, my love. And beyond First Bridge. It was because of Bantaro-san. Wasn't it? Yes, she said simply. That and Toranaga's decision to surrender. It's such a dishonorable uselessness. I never thought I'd ever say that out loud, but I have to say it. So sorry. She nestled closer into the protection of his shoulder. When he goes to Osaka, you're finished too? Yes. The Toda clan are too powerful and important. In any event, I would not be left alive. Then you must come with me. We'll escape. We'll, so sorry, but there's no escape. Unless Toranaga allows it, nay? Why should he allow it? Quickly Blackthorn told her what he had said to Toranaga, but not that he had also asked for her. I know I can force the priests to bring Kiyama or Onosher to his side, if he'll allow me to take this black ship. He finished excitedly. And I know I can do that. Yes, she said, glad for the sake of the church that he was hobbled by Toranaga's decision. Again she examined the logic of his plan and found it flawless. It should work, Anjin-san. Now that harem is hostile... There would be no reason why Toranaga-sama shouldn't order an attack if he were going to war, and not surrendering. If Lord Kiyama or Lord Onosher, or both of them, joined him, would that tip the scale toward him? Yes, she said. With Zataki in time. She had already explained the strategic importance of Zataki's control of the northern route. But Zataki's opposed to Toranaga-sama. Listen, I can strangle the priests. So sorry, but they are my enemy though they are your priests. I can dominate them on his behalf on mine too. Will you help me to help him? She stared up at him. How? Help me to persuade him to give me the chance, and persuade him to delay going to Osaka. There was the sound of horses and voices raised on the jetty. Distracted, they went to the windows. Samurai were pulling aside one of the barriers. Father Alvito spurred forward into the clearing. What does he want? Blackthorn muttered sourly. They watched the priest as he dismounted and pulled out a scroll from his sleeve and gave it to the senior samurai. The man read it. Alvito looked up at the ship. Whatever it is, is official, she said in a small voice. Listen, Mariko-san, I'm not against the church. The church isn't evil, it's the priests. And they're not all bad. Alvito isn't, though he's fanatic. I swear to God I believe the Jesuits will bow to Lord Toranaga if I get their black ship and threaten next year's, 
because they'd got to have money Portugal and Spain have got to have money. Torinaga's more important. Will you help me? Yes. Yes, I'll help you, Anjin san But please excuse me, I cannot betray the church. All I ask is that you talk to Torinaga, or help me to talk to him if you think that's better. A distant bugle sounded. They looked out of the windows again. Everyone was staring west. The head of a procession of samurai around a curtained litter approached from the direction of the castle. The cabin door opened. Anjin san, you will come now, please, the samurai said. Blackthorn led the way on deck and down to the jetty. His nod to Alvido was coldly polite. The priest was equally glacial. To Mariko, Alvito was kind. Hello, Mariko san. How nice to see you. Thank you, father, she said, bowing low. May the blessings of God be upon you. He made the sign of the cross over her. In nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Thank you, father. Alvito glanced at Blackthorn. So, pilot? How is your ship? I'm sure you already know. Yes, I know. Alvito looked Erasmus over, his face taut. May God curse her and all who sail in her if she's used against faith and Portugal. Is that why you came here? To spread more venom? No, pilot, Alvito said. I was asked here to meet Lord Torinaga. I find your presence as distasteful as you find mine. Your presence isn't distasteful, father. It's just the evil you represent. Alvito flushed and Mariko said quickly, Please. It is bad to quarrel this way in public. I beg you both to be more circumspect. Yes, please excuse me. I apologize, Mariko-san. Father Alvito turned away and looked at the curtain litter coming through the barrier, Torinaga's pennant fluttering, and uniformed samurai before and after, hemming in a straggling, motley group of samurai. The palanquin stopped. The curtains parted. Yabu stepped out. Everyone was startled. Nonetheless they bowed. Yabu returned the salutation arrogantly. Ah, Anjin-san. Yabu said. How are you? Good, thank you, sire. And you? Good, thank you. Lord Torinaga's sick. He asked me to come in his place. You understand? Yes. Understand. Blackthorn replied, trying to cover his disappointment at Torinaga's non-arrival. So sorry, Lord Torinaga sick. Yabu shrugged, acknowledged Mariko deferentially pretended not to notice Alvito, and studied the ship for a moment. His smile was twisted as he turned back to Blackthorn. So disu, Anjin-san. Your ship's different from the last time I saw it, nay? Yes, the ship's different, you're different, everything's different, even our world's different. Nay? So sorry, I don't understand, sire. Please excuse me, but your words very fast. As my... Blackthorn began the stock phrase, but Yabu interrupted gutturally. Mariko-san, please translate for me. She did so. Blackthorn nodded and said slowly, Yes. Different Yabu-sama. Yes, very different Yuri, no longer barbarian but samurai, and so is your ship, nay? Blackthorn saw the smile on the thick lips, the pugnacious stance, and suddenly he was back at Anjiro back on the beach on his knees, crook in the cauldron, piders and screams ringing in his ears, the stench of the pit in his nostrils, and his mind was shouting. So unnecessary all that all the suffering and terror and piders and, and Spielbergen and Matesucker, and the jail and ETA and trapped and all your fault. Are you all right, Anjin-san? Mariko asked, apprehensive at the look in his eyes. What? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm all right. What's the matter with him? Yabu said. Blackthorn shook his head, trying to clear it and wash the hatred off his face. So sorry. Please excuse me. I my it's nothing. Head bad no sleep. So sorry. He stared back into Yabu's eyes, hoping he had covered his dangerous lapse. Sorry Torinaga-sama sick hope no trouble Yabu-sama. No, no trouble. 
Yabu was thinking, yes trouble, you're nothing but trouble and I've had nothing but trouble ever since you and your filthy ship arrived on my shores. Eyes are gone, my gun's gone, all honor gone, and now my head forfeit because of a coward. No trouble, Anjin-san, he said so nicely. Torinaga-sama asked me to hand over your vassals to you as he promised. His eyes fell on Alvito. So, Tsuka-san, why are you enemy to Torinaga-sama? I'm not, Kasiji Yabusama. Your Christian daimyos are, nay? Please excuse me, sire, but we are priests only. We're not responsible for the political views of those who worship the true faith nor do we exercise control over those daimyos who, the true faith of this land of the gods is Shinto, together with the Tao, the way of Buddha. Alvito did not answer. Yabu turned contemptuously away and snapped an order. The ragged group of samurai began to line up in front of the ship. Not one was armed. Some had their hands bound. Alvito stepped forward and bowed. Perhaps you will excuse me, sire. I was to see Lord Toranaga. As he isn't coming, Lord Toranaga wanted you here to interpret for him with the Anjin-san. Yabu interrupted with deliberate bad manners, as Toranaga had told him to do. Yes, to interpret as you alone can do so cleverly, speaking directly and at once, nay? Of course you have no objection to doing for me what Lord Toranaga required before you go? No, of course not, sire. Good. Mariko-san, Lord Toranaga asks that you see the Anjin-san's responses are equally correctly translated. Alvito reddened but held on to his temper. Yes, sire, Mariko said, hating Yabu. Yabu snapped another order. Two samurai went to the litter and returned with the ship's strongbox, heavy between them. Tsuko-san, now you will begin. Listen, Anjin-san, firstly, Lord Toranaga's asked me to return this. It's your property, nay? Open it. He ordered the samurai. The box was brimful with silver coins. This is as it was taken off the ship. Thank you. Blackthorn was hardly able to believe his eyes, for this gave him power to buy the very best crew, without promises. It is to be put in the ship's strong room. Yes, of course. Yabu waved those samurai aboard. Then, to Alvito's growing fury as he continued with the almost simultaneous translating, Yabu said, Next, Lord Toranaga says you are free to go or to stay. When you are in our land you are samurai, Hatamoto, and governed by samurai law. At sea, beyond our shores, you are as you were before you came here and governed by barbarian laws. You are granted the right for your lifetime to dock at any port in Lord Toranaga's control without search by port authorities. Last, these two hundred men are your vassals. He asked me to formally hand them over, with arms, as he promised. I can leave when and how I want. Blackthorn asked with disbelief. Yes, Anjin-san, you can leave as Lord Toranaga has agreed. Blackthorn stared at Mariko, but she avoided his eyes, so he looked again at Yabu. Could I leave tomorrow? Yes, if you want to. Yabu added. About these men. They're all ronin. All from the northern provinces. They've all agreed to swear eternal allegiance to you and your seed. All are good warriors. None has committed a crime that could be proved. All became ronin because their liege lords were killed, died, or were deposed. Many fought on ships against Wako. Yabu smiled in his vicious way. Some may have been Wako you understand Wako? Yes, sire. Those who are bound are probably bandits or wacko. They came forward as a band and volunteered to serve you fearlessly in return for a pardon for any past crimes. They've sworn to. Lord Noboni who handpicked all these men for you on Lord Toranaga's orders that they've never committed any crime against Lord Toranaga or any of his samurai. You can accept them individually, or as a group, or refuse them. You understand? I can refuse any of them? Why should you do that? Yabu asked. Lord Noboru picked them carefully. Of course, so sorry. Blackthorn told Yabu wearily, conscious of the daimyo's growing ill humor. I quite understand. 
but those who are bound what happens if I refuse them? Their heads will be hacked off. Of course. What's that got to do with anything? Nothing. So sorry. Follow me. Yabu stalked over to the litter. Blackthorn glanced at Mariko. I can leave. You heard it. Yes. That means. It's almost like a dream. He said Anjin San. Obediently Blackthorn hurried over to Yabu. Now the litter served as a dais. A clerk had set up a low table on which were scrolls. A little farther off, samurai guarded a pile of short swords and long swords, spears, shields, axes, bows and arrows, that porters were unloading from pack horses. Yabu motioned Blackthorn to sit beside him, Alvito just in front and Mariko on his other side. The clerk called out names. Each man came forward, bowed with great formality, gave his name and lineage, swore allegiance, signed his scroll, and sealed it with a drop of blood that the clerk richly pricked from his finger. Each knelt to Blackthorn a final time, then got up and hurried to the armorer. First he was handed a killing sword, then the short one. Each accepted both blades with reverence, and examined them meticulously, expressing pride at their quality, and shoved them into his sash with savage glee. Then he was issued other weapons and a war shield. When the men took up their new places, fully armed now, samurai again and no longer ronin, they were stronger and straighter and looked even more fierce. Last were the thirty bound ronin. Blackthorn insisted on personally cutting the bonds of each. One by one they swore allegiance as had all the others. On my honor as a samurai, I swear your enemies are my enemies, and total obedience. After each man had sworn, he collected his weapons. Yabu called out, Yuraga no Tadamesa. The man stepped forward. Alvito was heartsick. Yuraga brother Joseph had been standing unnoticed among the samurai grouped nearby. He was unarmed and wore a simple kimono and bamboo hat. Yabu smirked at Alvito's discomposure and turned to Blackthorn. Anjid-san. This is Yuraga no Tadamesa. Samurai now Ronin. You recognize him? Understand recognize? Yes. Understand. Yes, recognize. Good. Once Christian priest, nay? Yes. Now not. Understand? Now Ronin. Understand, Yabu-sama. Yabu watched Alvito. Alvito was staring fixedly at the apostate, who stared back with hatred. Ah, uh, Tsukasan, you recognize him too? Yes. I recognize him, sire. Are you ready to translate again or haven't you any stomach for it anymore? Please continue, sire. Good. Yabu waved a hand at Yuraga. Listen, Anjin-san, Lord Toranaga gives this man to you, if you want him. Once he was a Christian priest, a novice priest. Now he's not. Now he's denounced the false foreign god and has reverted to the true faith of Shinto, and he stopped as the father stopped. Did you say it exactly, Tsukasan? True faith of Shinto? The priest did not answer. He exhaled, then said it exactly, adding, that's what he said, Anjin-san, may God forgive him. Mariko let that pass without comment, hating Yabu even more, promising herself vengeance on him one day soon. Yabu watched them, then he continued. So Yuraga-san's a Christian that was. Now he's prepared to serve you. He can speak barbarian and the private tongue of the priests, and he was one of the four samurai you sent to your lands. He even met the chief Christian of all the Christians. So they say but now he hates them all, just like you, nay? Yabu was watching Ovito, baiting him, his eyes flicking back and forth to Mariko, who was listening as intently. You hate Christians, Anjin-san, nay? Most Catholics are my enemy, yes, he answered, completely aware of Mariko, who was staring stonily into the distance. Spain and Portugal are enemies of my country, yes. Christians are our enemies, too. At Sukkasan? No, sire. And Christianity gives you the key to immortal life. Does it, Yuraga-san? Yabu said. Yuraga shook his head. 
His voice was raw. I no longer think so, sire. No. Tell the Anjin-san. Senor Anjin-san. Uraga said, his accent thick but his Portuguese words correct and easily understandable. I do not think this Catholicism is the Loxo Sari, is the key to immortality. Yes, Blackthorn said. I agree. Good, Yabu continued. So Lord Toranaga offers this ronin to you, Anjin-san. He's renegade but from good samurai family. Uraga swears if you'll accept him, he'll be your secretary, translator, and do anything you want. You'll have to give him swords. What else, Uraga? Tell him. Senor, please excuse me. First. Uraga took off his hat. His hair was a stubble now, his pate shaven in samurai style, but he had no cue yet. First, I'm shamed my hair is not correct and I have no cue as a samurai should have. But my hair will grow and I am not less samurai for that. He put his hat back on his head. He told Jabu what he had said, and those ronin who were near and could hear also listened attentively as he continued. Second, please excuse me greatly but I cannot use swords or any weapons. I've I've never been trained in them. But I will learn, believe me I will learn. Please excuse my shame. I swear absolute allegiance to you and beg you to accept me. Sweat trickled down his face and back. Blackthorn said compassionately, Chigata ga nai ne? Yukuru anata wadisu, Yuraga-san. What does that matter? I accept you, Yuraga-san. Yuraga bowed, then explained to Yabu what he had said. No one laughed. Except Yabu but his laughter was cut short by the beginning of an altercation between the last two ronin over the selection of the remaining swords. You two shut up, he shouted. Both men spun around and one snarled. You're not my master. Where are your manners? Say please or shut up yourself. Instantly Yabu leaped to his feet and rushed the offending ronin, his sword on high. Men scattered and the ronin fled. Near the side of the wharf the man jerked out his sword and abruptly turned to the attack with a fiendish battle cry. At once all his friends darted to his rescue, swords ready, and Yabu was trapped. The man charged. Yabu avoided a violent sword. Thrust, hacked back, and missed as the pack surged forward for the kill. Too late Toranaga samurai rushed forward, knowing Yabu was a dead man. Stop! Blackthorn shouted in Japanese. Everyone froze at the power of his voice. Go there! He pointed to where the men had been lined up before. Now! Order! For a moment all the men on the wharf remained motionless. Then they started to move. The spell broke. Yabu darted at the man who had insulted him. The ronin jumped back, sidestepped, his sword held violently above his head, two-handed, waiting fearlessly for the next attack. His friends hesitated. Go there! Now! Order! Reluctantly but obediently, the rest of the men backed out of the way, sheathed their swords. Yabu and the man circled each other slowly. You! Blackthorn shouted. Stop! Sword down! I order! The man kept his furious eyes on Yabu, but he heard the order and wet his lips. He fainted left, then right. Yabu retreated and the man slipped out of his grasp and rushed nearer to Blackthorn and put his sword down in front of him. I obey, Anjin-san. I didn't attack him. As Yabu charged, he leaped out of the way and retreated fearlessly, more fleet than Yabu, younger than Yabu, taunting him. Yabu-san, Blackthorn called out. So sorry think mistake, nay? Perhaps. But Yabu spouted a flood of Japanese and rushed the man, who fled again without fear. Alvito was now coldly amused. Yabu-san said there's no mistake, Anjin-san. This cabron has to die, he says. No samurai could accept such an insult. Blackthorn felt all their eyes on him as he desperately tried to decide what to do. He watched Yabu stalk the man. Just to the left a Toranaga samurai aimed his bow. 
The only noise was that of the two men panting and running and shouting at one another. The ronin backed, then turned and ran away, around the clearing, sidestepping, weaving, all the time keeping up a guttural hissing flood of invective. Alvido said, He's baiting Yabu Anjinsan. He says, I'm samurai, I don't kill unarmed men like you, you're not a samurai. You're a manure stinking peasant, ah, so that's it. You're not samurai, you're ETA, nay? Your mother was ETA, your father was ETA, and... The Jesuit stopped as Yabu let out a bellow of rage and pointed at one of the men and shouted something. Yabu says, you. Give him his sword. The ronin hesitated and looked at Blackthorn for the order. Yabu turned to Blackthorn and shouted, Give him his sword. Blackthorn picked up the sword. Yabu-san, ask not fight, he said, wishing him dead. Please ask not fight, give him the sword. An angry murmur went through Blackthorn's men. He held up his hand. Silence! He looked at his ronin vassal. Come here. Please! The man watched Yabu, fainted left then right, and each time Yabu hacked at him in wild rage, but the man managed to slip away and race to Blackthorn. This time Yabu did not follow. He just waited and watched like a mad bull readying his charge. The man bowed to Blackthorn and took the sword. Then he turned on Yabu and, with a howling battle cry, flung himself to the attack. Swords clashed and clashed again. Now the two men circled in the silence. There was another frantic exchange, the swords singing. Then Yabu stumbled, and the ronin charged in for the easy kill. But Yabu neatly sidestepped and struck. The man's hands, still gripping the sword, were sliced off. For a moment the ronin stood there howling, staring at his stumps, then Yabu hacked off his head. There was silence. Then a roar of applause surrounded Yabu. Yabu slashed once more at the twitching corpse. Then, honor vindicated, he picked up the head by the topknot, spat carefully in the face, and tossed it aside. Quietly he walked back to Blackthorn, and bowed. Please excuse my bad manners, Anjit-san. Thank you for giving him his sword, he said, his voice polite, Alvido translating. I apologize for shouting. Thank you for allowing me to blood my sword honorably. His eyes dropped to the heirloom Torinaga had given him. Carefully he examined its edge. It was still perfect. He undid his silk sash to cleanse the blood away. Never touch a blade with your fingers, Anjin-san, that will ruin it. A blade must feel only silk or the body of an enemy. He stopped and looked up. May I politely suggest you allow your vassals to test their blades? It will be a good omen for them. Blackthorn turned to Yuraga. Tell them. When Yabu returned to his house it was late in the day. Servants took his sweat-soiled clothes and gave him a fresh lounging kimono and put his feet into clean tabi. Yuriko, his wife, was waiting for him in the cool of the veranda with cha and sake, piping hot, the way he liked to drink it. Sake Jabusan? Yuriko was a tall, thin woman with gray-streaked hair. Her dark kimono of poor quality set off her fair skin nicely. Thank you, Yuriko-san. Yabu drank the wine gratefully, enjoying the sweet, harsh rasp as it slid down his parched throat. It went well, I hear. Yes. How impertinent of that ronin. He served me well, lady, very well. I feel fine now. I blooded Toronada's sword and made it really mine. Yabu finished the cup and she refilled it. His hand fondled his sword hilt. But you wouldn't have enjoyed the fight. He was a child he fell into the first trap. She touched him tenderly. I'm glad he did, husband. Thank you, but I hardly got up a sweat. Yabu laughed. You should have seen the priest, though. It would have made you warm to see that barbarian sweating I've never seen him so angry. He was so angry it almost choked him to hold it in. Cannibal! They're all cannibals. Pity there's no way to stamp them out before we depart this earth. Do you think the Anjin Sand could? He's going to try. With ten of those ships and ten of him, I could control the seas from here to Kyushu. 
With only him I could hurt Kiyama, Onoshir, and Harima and smash Jikyu and keep Aizu. We only need a little time and every daimyo be fighting his own special enemy. Aizu would be safe and mine again. I don't understand why Toranaga's going to let the Anjin San go. That's another stupid waste. He bunched his fist and slammed it on the tatamas. The maid flinched but said nothing. Yuriko did not make the slightest move. A smile flickered across her face. How did the Anjin San take his freedom and his vassals? She asked. He was so happy he was like an old man dreaming he had a four-pronged young. He oh yes. Yabu frowned, remembering. But there was one thing I still don't understand. When those wacko first surrounded me I was a dead man. No doubt about it. But the Anjinsan stopped them and gave me back my life. No reason for him to do that, nay? Just before, I'd seen the hate written all over him. So naive to pretend otherwise as if I'd trust him. He gave you your life? Oh yes. Strange, nay? Yes. Many strange things are going on, husband. She dismissed the maid, then asked quietly, What did Toranaga really want? Yabu bent forward and whispered, I think he wants me to become commander-in-chief. Why should he do that? Is Iron Fist dying? Yuriko asked. What about Lord Sidara? Or Buntaro? Or Lord Noboru? Who knows, lady? They're all out of favor, nay? Toranaga changes his mind so often no one can predict what he'll do now. First he asked me to go in his place to the wharf and told how he wanted everything said. Then he talked about Hiromatsu, how old he was getting, and asked what I really thought about the musket regiment. Could he be ready in Crimson Sky again? That's always ready. But he hasn't got the fruit for it. That will need leadership and skill. Once he had it, not now. Now he's a shadow of the Minoera he was. I was shocked at how he looked. So sorry, I made a mistake. I should have gone with Ishido. I think you chose correctly. What? First have your bath, then I think I have a present for you. What present? Your brother Mizuno is coming after the evening meal. That's a present? Yabu bristled. What would I want with that fool? Special information or wisdom, even from a fool, can be just as valuable as from a counselor, nay? Sometimes more so. What information? First your bath. And food. You'll need a cool head tonight, Yabu-chan. Yabu would have pressed her but the bath tempted him, and in truth, he was filled with a pleasing lassitude he had not felt in many a day. Part of it was due to Toranaga's deference this morning part to the general's deference over the last few days. But most of it was due to the killing, the ripple of joy that had rushed from sword to arm to head. Ah, to kill so cleanly, man to man in front of men that's a joy given to so few, so rarely. Rare enough to be appreciated and savored. So he left his wife and relaxed further into his joy. He allowed hands to tend his body and then, refreshed and renewed, he went to a veranda room. The last rays of sunset bedecked the sky. The moon was low, crescent, and thin. One of his personal maids served his evening meal delicately. He ate sparingly and in silence. A little soup and fish and pickled vegetables. The girl smiled invitingly. Shall I turn down the futons now, sire? Yabu shook his head. Later. First tell my wife I wish to see her. Yuriko arrived wearing a neat but old kimono. So Sodisuka? Your brother's waiting. We should see him alone. See him first, sire, then we'll talk, you and I also alone. Please be patient, nay? Kasiji Mizuno, Jabu's younger brother and Omi's father, was a small man with bulbous eyes, high forehead, and thin hair. His swords did not seem to suit him, and he could barely handle them. Even with bow and arrow he was not much better. Mizuno bowed and complimented Yabu on his skill this afternoon, for the news of the exploit had quickly spread around the castle, further enhancing Yabu's reputation as a fighter. Then, anxious to please, 
he came to the point. I received a coded letter today from my son, sire. The Lady Yuriko thought I'd better give it to you personally. He handed the scroll to Yabu, with the decoding. The message from Omi read, Father, please tell Lord Yabu quickly and privately. First Lord Buntaro came to Mishima, secretly via Takato. One of his men let this slip during a drunken evening that I'd arranged in their honor. Second, during this secret visit at Takato, which lasted three days, Bantaro saw Lord Zataki twice and the lady, Zataki's mother, three times. Third, before Lord Hiromatsu left Mishima he told his new consort, the Lady Oko, not to worry because while I'm alive Lord Torinaga will never leave the Quanto. Fourth, that. Yaba looked up. How can Omi-san possibly know what Iron Fist said privately to his consort? We don't have spies in his house. We have now, sire. Please read on. Fourth, that Hiromatsu is resolved to commit treason, if necessary, and will confine Torinaga in Yido, if necessary, and will order Crimson Sky over Torinaga's refusal with or without Lord Sadara's assent, if necessary. Fifth, that these are truths that can be believed. Lady Oko's personal maid is the daughter of my wife's foster mother and was introduced into the Lady Oko's service here at Mishima when, regrettably, her own maid curiously acquired a wasting malaise. Sixth, Bantaro-san is like a madman. Brooding and angry today he challenged and slaughtered a samurai purposelessly, cursing the name of the Anjin-san. Last, spies report that Akawa Jikyu has massed 10,000 men in Suruga ready to sweep across our borders. Please give Lord Yabu my greetings. The rest of the message was inconsequential. Jikyu, eh? Must I go to my death with that devil unrevenged? Please be patient, sire, Yuriko said. Tell him, Mizuno-san. Sire, the little man began. For months we've tried to put your plan into effect, the one you suggested when the barbarian first arrived. You remember, with all those silver coins, you mentioned that a hundred or even five hundred in the hands of the right cook would eliminate Ikawa Jiku once and for all. Mizuno's eyes seemed to grow even more frog-like. It seems that Mura, headman of Anjiro, has a cousin who has a cousin whose brother now is the best cook in Suruga. I heard today he's been accepted into Jiku's household. He's been given two hundred on account, and the whole price is five hun. We haven't got that money. Impossible. How can I raise five hundred? I am so in debt now I can't even raise one hundred. Please excuse me, sire. So sorry, but the money's already set aside. Not all the barbarian coins remained in the strongbox. A thousand coins strayed before it was officially counted. So sorry. Yabu gawked at him. How? It seems Omi-san was ordered to do that in your name. The money was brought here secretly to the Lady Yuriko, from whom permission was asked and granted before risking your displeasure. Yabu thought about that a long time. Who ordered it? I did. After seeking permission. Thank you, Mizuno-san. And thank you, Yuriko-san. Yabu bowed to both. So, Jikyue? At long last. He clapped his brother warmly on the shoulder, and the smaller man was almost pathetic in his fawning pleasure. You did very well, brother. I'll send you some bolts of silk from the treasury. How is the lady your wife? Well, sire, very well. She asked you to accept her best wishes. We must have food together. Good, good. Now about the rest of the report, what are your views? Nothing, sire. I would be most interested in what you think it means. First, Yabu stopped as he caught his wife's look, cautioning him, and changed what he was going to say. First and last, it means that Omi-san, your son, is loyal and an excellent vassal. If I had control of the future I'd promote him, yes, he deserves promotion, nay? Mizuno was unctuously delighted. Yabu was patient with him, chatting with him, again complimenting him and... As soon as was polite, he dismissed him. Yuriko sent for Cha. When they were quite alone again, he said, 
What does the rest mean? Her face mirrored her excitement now. Please excuse me, sire, but I want to give you a new idea. Toranaga is playing us all for fools and has no intention, and never had any intention, of going to Osaka to surrender. Nonsense! Let me give you facts. Oh, sire, you don't know how fortunate you are in your vassal Omi and that stupid brother who stole a thousand coins. Proof of my theory could be as follows. Bantaro-san, a trusted intimate, is sent to Zataki secretly. Why? Obviously to carry a new offer. What would tempt Zataki? The Quanto only that. So the offer is the Quanto in return for allegiance. Once Torunaga is again president of the Council of Regents, a new one with the new mandate. He can afford to give it then, nay? Eh? She waited, then went on painstakingly. If he persuades Zataki to betray Ishido, he's a quarter of the way to the capital, Kyoto. How can the pact with his brother be cemented? Hostages. I heard this afternoon Lord Sadara, the Lady Genjiko, and their daughters and their son are going to visit their revered grandmother at Takato within ten days. All of them? Yes. Next Toranaga gives the Anjinsan back his ship, as good as new, with all the cannon and powder. 200 fanatics and all that money, surely enough to buy more barbarian mercenaries, wacko scum out of Nagasaki. Why? To allow him to attack and take the black ship of the barbarians. No black ship, no money, and immense trouble for the Christian priests who control Kiyama, Onoshir, and all traitorous Christian daimyos. Toranaga never dared to do that. The Taiko tried and failed and he was all-powerful. The barbarians will sail away in fury. We'll never trade again. Yes. If we did it. But this time it's barbarian against barbarian, nay? It's nothing to do with us. And say the Anjin-san attacks Nagasaki and puts it to the Torchaya sent Harima now hostile, and Kiyama and Onoshir, and because of them, most Kyushu daimyos? Say the Anjin-san burns a few of their other ports, harries their shipping, and at the same time, and at the same time Toranaga launches Crimson Sky. Yabu exploded. Yes. Oh yes. Yuriko agreed happily. Doesn't this explain Toranaga? Doesn't this intrigue fit him like a skin? Isn't he doing what he's always done, just waiting like always, playing for time like always, a day here a day there and soon a month has passed and again he has an overwhelming force to sweep all opposition aside? He's gained almost a month since Sataki brought the summons to Yokos. Jabu could feel his pulse roaring in his ears. Then we're safe? No, but we're not lost. I believe it's no surrender. She hesitated. But everyone was deceived. Oh, he's so clever, nay? Everyone fooled like us. Until tonight. Omi gave me the clues. We all forgot Toranaga is a great no-actor who can wear his own face as a mask if need be. Nay. Yabu tried to marshal his thoughts but could not. But Ishido still has all Japan against us. Yes. Less Sataki. And there must be other secret alliances. Toranaga and you can hold the passes until the time. Ishido has Osaka Castle and the air and the Taiko's wealth. Yes but he'll stay skulking inside. Someone will betray him. What should I do? The opposite to Toranaga. Let him do the waiting, you must force the pace. How? The first thing, sire, is this, Toranaga's forgotten the one thing you noticed this afternoon. The Tsukasan's total fury. Why? Because the Anjin-san threatens the Christian future, nay? So you've got to put the Anjin-san under your protection at once, because those priests or their puppets will murder him within hours. Next, the Anjin-san needs you to protect and guide him, to help him get his new crew at Nagasaki. Without you and your men he has to fail. Without him and his ship and his cannon and more barbarians, Nagasaki won't burn, and that must happen or Kiyama, Onoshir and Harima and the filthy priests won't be distracted enough to temporarily withdraw their support from Ishido. Meanwhile, Toranaga, 
now miraculously supported by Zataki and his fanatics, with you leading the musket regiment, sweeps through the Shinano passes down to the Kyoto Plains. Yes. Yes, you are right, Yuriko-chan. It has to be that way. Oh, you are so clever, so wise. Wisdom and luck are no good without the means to put a plan into effect, sire. You alone can do that you read the leader, the fighter, the battle general that Torinaga must have. You must see him tonight. I can't go to Torinaga and tell him I've seen through his ruse, nay? No, but you'll beg him to allow you to go with the Anjin-san, that you must leave at once. We can think of a plausible reason. But if the Anjin-san attacks Nagasaki and the black ship, won't they stop trading and sail away? Yes. Possibly. But that's next year. By next year Torinaga will be a regent, president of the regents. And you his commander-in-chief. Yabu came down from the clouds. No, he said firmly. Once he has power he'll order me to commit seppuku. Long before that you will have the quanto. His eyes blinked. How? Torinaga will never actually give his half-brother the quanto. Zataki's a perpetual threat. Zataki's a wild man, pride-filled, nay? It will be so easy for Torinaga to maneuver Zataki into begging for the foremost place in the battle. If Zataki doesn't get killed. Perhaps a stray bullet or arrow? Probably a bullet. You must lead the musket regiment in the battle, sire. Why shouldn't I receive a stray bullet equally? You may, sire. But you're not Torinaga's kinsman and therefore no threat to his power. You will become his most devoted vassal. He needs fighting generals. You'll earn the quanto, and that should be your only goal. He'll give it to you when Ishido's betrayed because he'll take Osaka for himself. Vassal? But you said to wait and soon I nev. Now I counsel you to support him with all your strength. Not to follow his orders blindly like old iron fist, but cleverly. Don't forget Yabuchan, during battle, as in any battle, soldiers. Make mistakes, stray bullets do happen. So long as you lead the regiment, you can choose to any time, nay? Yes, he said, awed by her. Remember, Torinaga's worth following. He's Minoera, Ishido's a peasant. Ishido's the fool. I can see that now. Ishido should be hammering at the gates of Odawara right now, rain or no rains. Didn't Omi-san say that months ago too? Isn't Odawara undermanned? Isn't Torinaga isolated? Yabu pounded his fist on the floor with delight. Then it's war after all. How clever you are to have seen through him. Ah, uh, so he's been playing the fox all the time, nay? Eh? Yes, she said, greatly satisfied. Mariko had come to the same astonishing conclusion, though not from all the same facts. Torinaga must be pretending, playing a secret game, she reasoned. That's the only possible explanation for his incredible conduct giving the Anjin-san the ship, the money, all the cannon, and freedom in front of Sukasan. Now the Anjin-san will absolutely go against the black ship. He will take it, and threaten the one next year, and therefore he'll maul the Holy Church terribly and force the Holy Fathers to compel Kiyama and Onoshir to betray Ishido. But why? If that's true, she thought, perplexed, and Torinaga's considering such a long-range plan, then of course he can't go to Osaka and bow before Ishido, nay? He must. Ah, uh, what about today's delay that Hiromatsu persuaded Torinaga to make? Oh, Madonna on high, Torinaga never intended to surrender. It's all a trick. Why? To gain time. To accomplish what? To wait and weave a thousand more tricks, and it doesn't matter what, only that Torinaga's once more what he always was, the almighty puppeteer. How long before Ishido's impatience shatters and he raises the battle standard and moves against us? One month at the most two. No more. So by the ninth month of this fifth year of Kicho, the battle for the Quanto begins. But what's Torinaga gained in two months? I don't know I only know that now my son has a chance to inherit his ten thousand koku, and to live and breed, 
and that now perhaps my father's line will not perish from the earth. She relished her newfound knowledge, toying with it, examining it, finding her logic flawless. But what to do between now and then? She asked herself. Nothing more than you've already done and decided to do. Nay, mistress? Yes, Chimoko? Gyoko-san is here. She has an appointment, she says. Ah, yes. I forget to tell you. First heat sake, then bring it and her here. Mariko reflected on the afternoon. She remembered his arms around her, so safe and warm and strong. Can I see you tonight? He had asked very cautiously, after Yabu and Sukasan had left. Yes, she had said impulsively. Yes, my darling. Oh, how happy I am for thee. Tell Fujikosan. Ask her to send for me after the hour of the boar. In the quiet of her house her throat tightened. So much foolishness and danger. She checked her makeup and coiffure in her mirror and tried to compose herself. Footsteps approached. The shoji slid open. Ah, lady, Gyoko said, bowing deeply. How kind of you to see me. You're welcome, Gyoko-san. They drank sake, Chimoko pouring for them. Such lovely pottery, lady. So beautiful. They made polite conversation, then Chimoko was sent away. So sorry, Gyoko-san, but our master did not arrive this afternoon. I haven't seen him, though I hope to before I leave. Yes, I heard Yabu-san went to the jetty in his place. When I see Toranagasama, I will ask him once more. But I expect his answer will be the same. Mariko poured sake for both of them. So sorry, he will not grant my request. Yes, I believe you. Not unless there is great pressure. There's no pressure that I can use. So sorry. So sorry too, lady. Mariko put down her cup. Then you've decided that some tongues are not safe. Gyoko said harshly. If I were going to whisper secrets about you, would I tell you to your face? Do you think I'd be so naive? Perhaps you'd better go, so sorry, but I have so much to do. Yes, lady, and so have I, Gyoko replied, her voice rough. Lord Toranaga asked me, to my face, what I knew about you and the Anjin-san. This afternoon, I told him there was nothing between you. I said, oh yes, sire, I've heard the foul rumors too, but there's no truth in them. I swear it on the head of my son, sire, and his sons. If anyone would know, surely it would be me. You may believe it's all a malicious lie gossip, jealous gossip, sire. Oh yes, lady, you may believe I was suitably shocked, my acting perfect, and he was convinced. Gyoko quaffed the sake, and added bitterly, now we are all ruined if he gets proof which wouldn't be difficult to get. Nay. How? Put the Anjin-san to the test Chinese methods. Chimoko Chinese methods. Mikiku-san Yashinaka. So sorry, even you, Lady Chinese methods. Mariko took a deep breath. May may I ask you why you took such a risk? Because in certain situations women must protect each other against men. Because I actually saw nothing. Because you've done me no harm. Because I like you and the Anjin-san and believe you both have your own karmas. And because I'd rather have you alive and a friend than dead, and it's exciting to watch you three moths circling the flame of life. I don't believe you. Gyoko laughed softly. Thank you, lady. Controlled now, she said with complete sincerity. Very well, I'll tell you the real reason. I need your help. Yes, Toranaga-sama won't grant my request, but perhaps you can think of a way. You're the only chance I've ever had, that I'll ever have in this lifetime, and I can't release it lightly. There, now you know. Please, I humbly beg you to help me with my request. She put both hands on the futons and bowed low. Please excuse my impertinence, Lady Toda, but all that I have will be put at your side if you will help me. Then she settled back on her heels, adjusted the folds of her kimono, and finished the sake. Mariko tried to think straight. 
Her intuition told her to trust the woman but her mind was still partially befogged with her newfound insight into Toranaga and her relief that Gyoko had not. Denounce her as she had expected, so she decided to put that decision aside for later consideration. Yes, I will try. You must give me time, please. I can give you better than that. Here's a fact. You know Amida Tong? The assassins? What about them? Remember the one in Osaka Castle, lady? He went against the Anjinsan, not Toranagasama. Lord Kiyama's chief steward gave 2,000 koku for that attempt. Kiyama? But why? He's Christian, nay? The Anjinsan was the enemy even then, nay? If then, what about now? Now that the Anjinsan's samurai, and free, with his ship. Another Amida? Here? Gyoko shrugged. Who knows? But I wouldn't give an Ada's loincloth for the Anjinsan's life if he's careless outside the castle. Where is he now? In his quarters, lady. You're going to visit him soon, nay? Perhaps it'd be as well to warn him. You seem to know everything that's going on, Gyoko-san. I keep my ears open, lady, and my eyes. Mariko curbed her anxiety over Blackthorn. Did you tell Toranaga-sama? Oh yes, I told him that. The corners of Gyoko's eyes crinkled and she sipped her sake. As a matter of fact, I don't think he was surprised. That's interesting, don't you think? Perhaps you were mistaken. Perhaps. In Mishima I heard a rumor that there was a poison plot against Lord Kiyama. Terrible, nay? What plot? Gyoko told her the details. Impossible. One Christian daimyo would never do that to another. Mariko filled the cups. May I ask what else was said by you and by him? Part of it, lady, was my plea to get back into his favor and out of that flea sack in, and to that he agreed. Now we're to have proper quarters within the castle, near the Anjinsan, in one of the guest houses and I may come and go as I wish. He asked Kikusan to entertain him tonight, and that's another improvement, though nothing will get him out of his melancholia. Nay, Gyoko was watching Mariko speculatively. Mariko kept her face guileless and merely nodded. The other woman sighed and continued. Yes, he's very sad. Pity. Part of the time was spent on the three secrets. He asked me to repeat what I knew, what I told you. Ah, Mariko thought as another clue fell neatly into its slot. Okiba? So that was Zataki's bait. And Toronaga's also got a cudgel over Omi's head if needed, and a weapon to use against Onoshir with Harima, or even Kiyama. You smile, lady? Oh yes, Mariko wanted to say, wanting to share her elation with Gyoko. How valuable your information must have been to our master, she wanted to tell Gyoko. How he should reward you. You should be made a daimyo yourself. And how fantastic Toranaga-sama is to have listened, apparently so unconcernedly. How marvelous he is. But Toda Mariko Nobuntaro only shook her head and said calmly, I'm sorry your information didn't cheer him up. Nothing I said improved his humor, which was dull and defeated. Sad, nay? Yes, so sorry. Yes. Gyoko sniffed. Another piece of information before I go, to interest you, lady, to cement our friendship. It's very possible the Anjin-san is very fertile. What? Kiku-san's with child. The Anjin-san? Yes. Or Lord Toranaga? Possibly Omi-san. All were within the correct time span. Of course she took precautions after Omi-san as usual, but as you know, no method is perfect. Nothing is ever guaranteed. Mistakes happen, nay? She believes she forgot after the Anjin-san, but she's not sure. That was the day the courier arrived at Anjiro, and in the excitement of leaving for Yoko's and of Lord Toranaga's buying her contract it's understandable, nay? Yoko lifted her hands, greatly perturbed. After Lord Toranaga, at my suggestion, she did the reverse. Also we both lit incense sticks and prayed for a boy. Mariko studied the pattern on her fan. Who? Who do you think? 
That's the trouble, lady. I don't know. I'd be grateful for your advice. This beginning must be stopped. Of course. There's no risk to her. I agree. Unfortunately, Kiku-san does not agree. What? I'm astonished, Gyoko-san. Of course she must. Or Lord Torinaga must be told. After all, it happened before he, perhaps it happened before him, lady. Lord Torinaga will have to be told. Why is Kiku-san so disobedient and foolish? Karma, lady. She wants a child. Whose child? She won't say. All she said was that any one of the three had advantages. She'd be wise to let this one go and be sure next time. I agree. I thought you should know in case. There are many, many days before anything shows or before a miscarriage would be a danger to her. Perhaps she will change her mind. In this I cannot force her. She's no longer my property, though for the time being I'm trying to look after her. It would be splendid if the child was Lord Toronaga's. But say it had blue eyes. A last piece of advice, lady. Tell the Anjin-san to trust this Yuraga no Tadamesa only so far, and never in Nagasaki. Never there. That man's final allegiance will always be to his uncle, Lord Harima. How do you find out these things, Gyoko-san? Men need to whisper secrets, lady. That's what makes them different from us they need to share secrets. But we women only reveal them to gain an advantage. With a little silver and a ready ear and I have both it's all so easy. Yes. Men need to share secrets. That's why we're superior to them and they'll always be in our power. <laughs>